In this video, we're going to be covering the completely uncontroversial topic of biology's role in sex and gender development. In all seriousness, I am going to cover this topic as delicately as I can. But as with all the gender videos, keep in mind that some of the content and research might not match your beliefs and opinions. So is how masculine or feminine you are simply due to the levels of hormones like testosterone and estrogen in your bloodstream? And what happens if someone isn't born with the typical XX or XY combinations? Can you have extra chromosomes, so XXY? Or one less, so just X? Well, let's take a look. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. The role of chromosomes and hormones. So two aspects of the biological approach we need to consider are chromosomes and hormones. They are of course connected, with your genes coding for the levels of hormones in your body. But we could be asked about them separately, and their roles in both sex and gender, so I'm going to make sure I cover all of that. Most people have 46 chromosomes. They come in 23 pairs and are made of long strands of DNA. They are found in the nucleus of your cells. Now because they're made of DNA, chromosomes hold your genetic information, your genotypes. These code for physical and behavioural characteristics we call phenotypes. If we want to explain chromosomes role in biological sex, then it's fairly clear cut. Most, but not all people fall into the XX as biologically female and XY as biologically male. These chromosomal differences lead to biological differences. For example, testes develop in males, triggered by a sex-determining region on the Y chromosome. These testes produce high levels of testosterone, leading to additional secondary sex differences. When we come to chromosomes' role in gender, things become a little more contentious. The genetic differences between biologically male and female chromosomes create a range of biological changes in things like hormonal and neural differences that then go on to influence the expression of sex-type gendered behaviour. So how does this happen? Well, for this, we need to explain hormones. They are biochemical messages that travel in the bloodstream. The organs of the body respond to the presence or absence of these hormones, altering their function. It's likely you're aware of testosterone, what's known as an androgen, meaning a male sex hormone. Females do have testosterone, but the levels are usually around 10 times less than what we find in males. Testosterone's role in sex starts early. The SRY gene at around 7 weeks triggers the development of testes and stops the development of ovaries. The developing testes then start to produce testosterone. As males reach puberty, the presence of testosterone is responsible for secondary sexual characteristics, like larger muscles in adult males. As for testosterone's role in gender, it's thought to be linked to the increased levels of aggression and competitive behaviour in males. Oestrogen is the female sex hormone, again found in both males and females, but oestrogen is found in much higher levels in females. One of Eastern's roles in sex is the regulation of the menstrual cycle and the development of secondary sexual characteristics. Now, Eastern is thought to have a behavioural influence over feelings of irritability and levels of cooperative behaviour. A final hormone linked to sex differences is oxytocin. Now, generally this is produced in higher quantities in females, but during sex, it's produced in the same amounts in males and females. It stimulates lactation in females and it's thought to produce the caring and attachment feelings important both for the development of caring behaviours towards infants, but also in developing attachment in couples. The role of chromosomes and hormones. Research evaluations. If we're suggesting that gender is a biological process, then we can use biological evidence for atypical gender development to support that claim. Atypical gender is any individual whose gender identity doesn't follow the statistically typical male equals masculine, female equals feminine pattern. Another way of putting this is their gender identity doesn't match the sex assigned to them at birth. Now the next two evaluations are a little tricky, but we get to use them both for this section and for our final video in the unit where we cover atypical gender development. So overall, fewer evaluations to remember. The first by Van Boeschevelt looked at genetic evidence using a very large sample of over 8,000 twin pairs from the Netherlands. 
and these were either dizygotic, so sharing half the genome, or monozygotic, so genetically identical. The mothers of these twins were questioned about the gender identity of their children. When they looked at the data, the genetic difference between the monozygotic and dizygotic twins accounted for 70% of the variance in gender identity. Now this supports the idea that information coded within the chromosomes does influence gender identity, meaning gender is heritable. Another interesting aspect of this work was the data showed that little girls with a female co-twin were actually more likely to show cross-gendered behaviour than those of a male co-twin. And the researcher points out, this is the opposite of what we would expect if we wanted to explain gender with social learning theory. As we would expect little girls with brothers to use them as a role model and imitate their male gendered behaviour. So actually you could technically use this evaluation in three sections. I didn't include it in the social learning theory video, but this would make an interesting critical evaluation of the ideas we'll cover there. A recent study by Fieldston combines evidence for theories on genetics and hormones. This study was a complete analysis of the genetic material, so chromosomes, of 13 transgender individuals. This data was compared to the data held on 88 non-transgender controls. The analysis identified 21 gene variants that are involved in estrogen reception in areas of the brain that before birth become sexually dimorphic. So they are different between biological males and females. So what's this telling us? Well, first of all, that estrogen seems to have a role to play in producing sexually dimorphic brains, potentially leading to gendered behaviour. And that genetic variation might be resulting in variations in gender identity. Now, of course, depriving sex hormones or exposing people to high levels of sex hormones just to see how behaviour changes under experimental conditions would not be ethical. But these studies have been carried out on animals. It's been repeatedly shown that female rats and mice don't show the typical maternal caregiving behaviour if they're deprived of oestrogen and oxytocin. And that behaviour will restart when they're able to produce the hormone again. Also, male mice that are castrated, so no longer produce high levels of testosterone, stop showing typical male biting aggression. But that aggression returns when they're injected with testosterone. And females who are injected show aggressive biting behaviour typical of the males. The role of chromosomes and hormones. General evaluations. Now those animal studies are interesting. They seem to show a clear cause and effect relationship between gendered behaviour and hormone levels in experiments that we could never conduct in humans. But of course there is a big question about whether we can actually generalise those findings to humans. As we'll see over the next few videos, gender in humans is influenced by socialisation from parents, by wider cultural norms, and our cognitive ability to develop complex schemas to understand the world. Perhaps some animals, like primates, share some of those factors, but most animals don't. So it's likely not valid to say what we see in animal studies automatically applies to gender in humans. But one positive of this research is practical applications. Understanding the role hormones play on gendered behaviour could lead to hormonal therapies. Say for example for women who are struggling to pair bond with their infant, or addressing the issues around heightened aggression. But while we've talked about male and female sex hormones, to be honest that picture is too simplistic. One example is a form of oestrogen has been found to be vital in the male sex drive and in sperm production. But this can be treated by giving what has been traditionally thought to be a female sex hormone to males with low sex drives. And a final evaluation is really a point about holism and reductionism. Work by Van Anders showed that female's testosterone levels significantly increased if she did an activity that stimulated having power over another person. It was actually a role play about firing someone from a job. Now the researchers suggest that rather than just testosterone leading to male gendered behaviour, there's also the opposite process. But we live in a world where men are socialised to be more competitive and dominant, and women are socialised to be more cooperative. This could actually be increasing the relative difference of testosterone between the sexes even more. Okay, that was a little bit of a tricky evaluation, but hopefully you can see it suggests that a valid explanation of hormones role in gender is likely a complex interaction between social and biological factors. Atypical sex chromosomes. So I've mentioned typically people either have an XX or an XY 23rd pair of chromosomes. 
but there are rare atypical variations. Two that we need to cover here are XXY, a condition known as Kaplan syndrome, and X0, a condition known as Turner syndrome. Around 1 in 666 males have XXY. They have an additional X chromosome. But they do develop physically as males, but with some physical variations, like less facial hair. They're usually tall with long limbs. They have smaller than average testes and can develop breast tissue. There are also some psychological differences an increased likelihood of cognitive problems like dyslexia. They can generally be passive, but they do have some emotional problems like being easier to upset. Turner syndrome is a much rarer condition that affects around 1 in 2,000 girls. This is the lack of a second chromosome in the 23rd pair. The condition interferes with sexual development and results in a lack of a menstrual cycle. So females with Turner syndrome are sterile, meaning they're unable to have children of their own. The breasts tend not to develop and they have a shorter neck that is sometimes webbed and they generally look immature for their age. Psychologically, they can have a high verbal ability, so reading and writing, but their visual ability tends to be lower than what would be expected compared to their peers, and they might also act immature for their age. Psychological research on Kefner and Turner's syndrome has been important in improving the lives of these people. This is in part the development of hormone therapies, given oestrogen to females of Turner's around puberty helps to normalise physical development including increasing height. In the same way, males with Kefler syndrome who receive testosterone develop facial hair, show increased energy, so less passivity. And the data also suggests that the increased testosterone also improves some of the behavioural and learning problems. Now clearly research on atypical chromosome patterns is helpful in understanding the roles of typical chromosomal patterns in sex and gender. But researchers have to be careful of reading too much into the data. These are still very rare conditions and the behavioural aspects might not be a direct result of the genetic differences. For example, the fact that girls with Turner syndrome are often socially immature might actually be linked to their physical immature looks, and then how other people respond to them because of those looks. Here's a real gender exam question from 2017 on Turner syndrome and Kefler syndrome. So give it a go and see how you do. I do want to thank everybody who supported the channel over on Patreon while I've been making the gender unit. You've helped make the development of these A-level videos possible. If you're a PsychBoost patron at the Neuron level and above, you can access six bonus tutorial videos over on psychboost.com. In them, I'll talk you through a model answer for the exam questions, and I'll talk you through some general exam tips based on the examiner reports. But for everyone else, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the videos released right up to your exams. And I'll see you in the next PsychBoost video, Cognitive Explanations for Gender Development. <laughs>